like to welcome all the elevator enthusiasts here. And uh, you Elixir folks can listen in too. Uh, I'll start off talking about uh, my little embarrassing story of the day. Uh, first, understand I'm not a morning person. I like mornings, I just wish they happened later in the day. So I'm leaving the hotel room this morning, getting on the elevator, and I kind of have this mind goes blank. It's like, what do I do? Do I press a button? Which button do I press? And I'm supposed to talk about elevators this afternoon. So, uh, and there were actually a couple of other uh, attendees here on the elevator with me, so that was actually witnessed, which made it even worse. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about OTP with an elevator uh, system as my main example here. Uh, I'll start off with sort of the obligatory, you know, who am I? Uh, name's Greg Vaughn. Uh, been just doing Elixir hobby time in the evenings for a little over a year. I copied when my first commit to GitHub was for my first Elixir code. Um, currently employed by Living Social, work primarily in Ruby, um, and I have an obligatory, if you've been to a Ruby conference, you might have seen this before. We're hiring, we're not doing Elixir today, but I'd love to get more enthusiasts on board. Talk to me later if you're interested. And that's all the commercial portion of the program. OTP. This is what attracted me to Elixir. Um, I, I love the ability to, to know I can scale up, but yet, even as James was pointing out, it scales down really well too. So you can start simple, and you have that breathing room at the upper end. Um, so it's a lot of things, and I want to focus on a few things. It is, it's been around for, been open source for 16 years, and I read an internal um, history of Erlang uh, PDF file from Bjorn Docker, if I'm pronouncing it right, who said it was even identified by name a couple of years before that. So it's been around for longer than a lot of people's careers. Um, but it doesn't feel stodgy. It feels really powerful. Uh, a lot of lessons that have been learned have been codified in there. It's buzzword compliant, okay? You know, our industry loves to reinvent things and give them new names. And to me, this is what microservices really is. It's really describing an actor framework, but missing an important operational side of it, which I'll talk about some more later on. And I thought I was going to get to be controversial here. But I really love, you know, you know, you know, uh, Props to all the other speakers. OO is not a bad word, uh, but you have to kind of change your thinking about it a little, a little bit. You can't think in classes. Uh, the core ideas of OO are separate from classes. Uh, I'll defend this a little bit more on the next slide, but it doesn't need as much defense as I thought it might. Uh, actor based, we've heard lots of talk about actors uh, basically process in a, in a receive loop. Uh, that can respond to messages and store its state inside of it. Uh, I already used the word framework, but I like to make the distinction between libraries, which are code that you call to do some particular task for you, versus the, the Hollywood principle, the don't call us, we'll call you. Uh, your OTP behaviors are like an actor's manager, that they're the ones that, you know, uh, handle that run loop, handle exceptions, handle uh, uh, trapping exits, um, uh, all that sort of lot timeouts, all that sort of logic handled for you. Uh, it is design patterns. Uh, I, you know, I forget to, when I speak this morning I was saying, oh, it's functional, no design patterns. I think it was Richard. Uh, I think it is design patterns, uh, but it's a very simplified version of it. That the actor itself, actor uh, pattern, is a design pattern. The um, the Hollywood principle, the um, template methods, these sorts of things all appear in the framework. So you don't have to throw away any past you may have with object-oriented programming. Uh, you have to be careful you don't take what you've learned before too far, but there's still value in some of those things you've learned. And it's robust. It has the answer to what, what happens if it fails? Because it actually embraces, it's not an if, it's a when. If you scale large enough, it will fail at some point. Uh, even if you write bug-free code, hardware, networking problems, these sorts of things happen. So you have to be prepared for that failure, and it kind of makes it easy for you to separate uh, considerations of those two things. Uh, so I'll start out uh, this Alan Kay quote, not going to surprise uh, uh, many of you, uh, the core of what object-oriented means. 
And a lot of people like to take object-oriented and draw it uh, in contrast to functional programming. I think it's better to, to contrast functional programming with, programming with imperative programming. And that um, they're both about uh, how you deal with state primarily. Now, I've heard Erlang described as a concurrent, concurrency-oriented language. And I think Elixir inherits that just as much. So we have those processes right there at the VM level, uh, totally isolated memory spaces. Uh, Messaging is the only way to get in or out of those. So when you combine all three of these concepts together, actors are the natural culmination, and they're a very powerful abstraction to build your distributed systems around. So, I'd like to dig a little bit into the core concept to understand about OTP are the behaviors. Uh, behaviors versus your callback modules. I got really confused about these and some of the terminology when I started out, and I'd like to you know, hopefully uh, help some of you avoid that. This is about the simplest uh, gen server you could write here. It doesn't do anything but it will instantiate. It's actually the gen server start call with your callback module being passed in that actually starts everything up. That's what instantiates it. Uh, the actual use gen server that you put in your callback module really is just syntactic sugar. That's not, that prepares you to be a callback. That's not actually what instantiates you and starts things as a callback. And this callback is, is all about the contract between the behavior, and the callback module. I'd like to peel back the curtains a little bit here. Um, I actually copied this from uh, Elixir's GitHub repo a few weeks ago and reformatted it a little bit. This is what useGenServer does. It calls this macro. Now, if you don't know macros, it's not important. It's pretty clear what's happening here. It's giving you default implementations of the six contract callback functions that gen server requires. Now, they're mostly kind of do-nothing implementations, but they're all implemented there. It also adds that behavior uh, attribute to your, to your module, which, if I understand right, down, down at the uh, Erlang compiler level, this kind of makes sure that all these functions are available here. Well, Elixir has, has kindly provided them for you, so you're set. Uh, def overridable is a, is a piece that kind of says, if you write uh, this function in your module directly, use it. Uh, we're just kind of the fallbacks. So it's not a big mystery what's happening here. Uh, I want to note that the contract between the behavior and your callback module is not just the functions that, that you write, but also involves what you can return from that. Uh, usually tuples, sometimes it's just raw atoms. Um, we have some examples here. Uh, these are all documented uh, pretty well. I'd encourage you to, to read through those. There's some interesting, interesting um, I don't want to call them corner cases, but interesting uh, unfamiliar corners of it that uh, hopefully I can show a, a couple of these a little bit later on. And next slide, okay. So I've taken that simplest Gen server module and expand it a little bit. Uh, now it can actually respond to a message. Uh, but uh, I want to point out a couple of potential confusion points, uh, um, kind of uh, understand how, how data flows through the system. Uh, when you call a gen server start link, uh, your second, second term there is what gets passed into your init function. It's a single term, and your init function can do whatever it wants to with it, uh, but typically you'd return an OK state tuple. Uh, in this case, this one here is doing the same, uh, the same thing that the default implementation of the macro gives you, but I want to just kind of point it out here. And then that state is what gets passed in each time one of your callback handlers gets called. And this way, you sequentially process messages and the state you return from one message is what gets back to you on the next message. Um, that's the way functional programming, we're not modifying anything. You're just getting a new copy of this data, a potentially changed copy of this data coming into you each time around. 
And there's one little gotcha here that I don't know if anyone else has hit it. I was using a handle cast at one point, and I said, no, I want to change this to a handle call. So I changed the function name, and my code won't execute. Uh, it's important to understand that handle call has this extra from uh, parameter it's going to receive. Uh, there's some advanced things you can do with it. You can actually choose to defer responding to the caller. Uh, you, could, you could spawn a task and give it this from parameter, and, which could do something computationally intensive and then return to the caller. Um, most of the time you don't need it, but it's there to, for expansion purposes and allow you more possibilities of how to structure your particular problem. Uh, and this is one of the places where uh, I said this is not class oriented. Don't think of modules as classes or your brain will hurt. They're not classes. They're, names, they're namespaces. And it's important to understand that even in this namespace, certain functions may execute in different processes. Uh, the start link uh, up at the top there is really a convenience uh, a, um, convention. It's not required by the APIs, though you normally see it in the code. And this is typically going to execute in the, in, in the uh, uh, supervisor process. It's going to start you up. Uh, furthermore, then your init method, I, I say method, I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying really hard to get my terminology straight. Uh, the init function is uh, executing within your actor process, your OTP process. Then you have the convenient do it function, which is going to execute in some calling client. So it's, it's important to get your brain around this that different parts of your module can be intended to execute within different processes. And basic conventions kind of demand that. Uh, I included a couple of, of private functions here, but quite frankly, you could have other private functions that are intended to be called by one of the client-facing functions. So you can't even say all your private pieces are going to execute in one process or another. So it's something that requires a change of thinking to get your brain around. So I promised you elevators. I'd like to step back and share a little bit of a, of a story. Uh, about two years ago, I was at a user group in the Dallas area that we call Hat Club. And we get together kind of practicing our craft of programming. Uh, usually we're pair programming with someone. Uh, we might want to learn a new language. We might want to try test-driven development techniques, uh, try some new library. And the idea behind that is to have a problem that you can solve in an hour or two, and then we all kind of look at how each other solved it. Well, I was sitting there uh, with someone who wanted to learn Ruby, and so I was teaching him some Ruby as we were going along. And the, the, prob the problem that night was to simulate an elevator. And it was only after I had done, you know, 30 minutes of it or so, I realized this tick method kept coming up in all of our tests. And it dawned on me that this is inherently a concurrent problem. Elevators have to be able to move around while people on other floors are saying, hey, come here, come here, I'm pushing buttons. Um, so these things have to happen at the same time, at least conceptually. And I thought from that, perhaps I should spend some time digging into threads and fibers in Ruby. But that's pretty anemic. It wasn't really worth spending time on. I thought maybe I should learn celluloid. Uh, read, read up about it, and I realized that, or I learned there that it was strongly influenced by OTP. Uh, so then when I finally heard about Dave's book, uh, and he was saying, Elixir is the greatest thing since, or, or I forget how he phrased it. it it's made him the happiest, as that, that same sort of feeling as when he first, first met Ruby. And Ruby's treated me pretty well, so I decided to dig in. And I wanted to solve this elevator problem in a good, concurrent fashion. Uh, I like this problem set because we're all familiar with elevators. Uh, it's a little bit more, it has, has a few more nuances than a lot of the other example OTP apps that I've seen before. And uh, I've been spending you know, my hobby time learning about it. And uh, now I get to share that with you. Now, I've not gone crazy trying to model elevators as this, as, this, as this state machine, when are the doors open, you know, when the doors close, what happens when you press the little fireman's hat button. Um, 
uh, I just kept it really simple here. The idea is that a writer process will send a floor hail. Um, I wanted to call this a floor call, but OTP already had, uh, uh, had claims on call. It sends it to a hall signal. I wanted to call this a hall monitor. <laughs> so <laughs> naming has been a bit of a challenge. I want to curse you, OTP, for keeping all the, getting all the good names. Um, so a writer uh, process is going to send the floor hail to a, a, a hall signal. Uh, elevator cars are, are, are going to pull that and uh, retrieve that hail. And then it's going to travel to the floor and notify the, the writer process, hey, I've arrived. Uh, it's going to pass its PID back in that call. Then the writer can, can tell that particular car that arrived where it wants to go. And then when the car gets there, it notifies the writer. So this is sort of our message passing what's going on here. Now, I don't want to lose fact uh, that we're still in a functional language. And in a functional language, if you can define your data structures well, it'll make your life a lot simpler. Uh, a lot, lot of my core logic focused around this hail struct, which is going to consist of a floor and a direction and an optional writer PID. Uh, with that, I was able to build out helper functions around that and really kept the main logic in my OTP callback um, modules pretty simple. And I would like to jump to the code now. I had great designs of, or great ideas of doing, wonderful, and I seem to be, exit, here we go. All right. Is that pretty, is that, is that legible or should I go to a light background? Okay. And I am not getting my input. Better? Size good? Bigger, bigger. Okay. So this is my, the hail struct that, um, as I said, um, struct with direction, floor, and a co an optional caller. And I have uh, matching and sorting types of functions available on this. Most of them take a list of hails as a first parameter and then a specific hail to, to match or sort around is the second one. Uh, I really wanted to go deeper into the code, but as I was rehearsing and timing issues, uh, it's going to be a fairly cursory glance, but if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to talk more about this, you know, uh, any time during the conference. Um, so the hail is the kind of the core data structure part of it, and then I also mentioned the hall signal is uh, really simple. I possibly could have done this with an agent, but I wanted it to respond to a couple of messages here. So this is how a person waiting for the elevator can do that. Uh, see, I called it a floor call here uh, instead of a floor hail. Um, I started out calling it, a, naming it a call and realized the uh, confusion later. Uh, so it basically has a state that's a list of hails. So it kind of, it's a, it, will, it will know all the people on different floors that want to go which direction. Uh, I didn't make the logic smart where it tries to decide which elevator car to send it to, so I let the cars actually pull it. So let me show you the car. Uh, this guy uh, also defined a struct on it. I could have used a map just as well. Uh, I was able to reuse the hail to serve as the position of an elevator car, because it's got a direction and it's got a floor. Uh, the, elevator also, the elevator car also keeps track of stops that it has to make, which may be ones that people who got on the elevator pressed, and maybe ones that came from people outside the elevator. And, a, and it has a tick value. Uh, this is my way of getting this car to be processing things in the background, uh, regardless of what messages it receives at the time. Uh, it's one of those, I, I mentioned these little lesser used corners of some of the contract between the gen server behavior and your callback module. If you return uh, in this third parameter, 
uh, an integer, you get what's known as a timeout value. And your gen server behavior is going to watch that. And if you don't receive a message in that amount of time and you feel lonely, it will send you a new message. And what that looks like here is uh, down here, you get a handle info type, and you just receive the timeout atom. And I'll tell you, I tell you after, after Dave's talk, I feel, I feel really smart for that line of code right there because <laughs> my main process in here is a pipeline. So I'm able to uh, retrieve a call, which is I'm polling that hall signal to say, you got anywhere else for me to go. Then I can do a check arrival to see, am I at a floor anyone cares about? And then I can move. And so I'll receive this at least, uh, in my case, uh, every one second. Or uh, it, may be, it may be longer than every one second because of other messages coming in. It's not, it's not a perfect uh, heartbeat tick, uh, which, you, which you could do with a separate timer process, but I liked exploring this part of the API. And so that means I'm having to store the tick in my state, and I, and I have to return that as a third parameter to all those uh, uh, callback calls that uh, the gen server behavior will make into me. And this is a really simple uh, application, which this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you new versions of this as we go along. This was the simple code I was able to put together just for the start of learning OTP. And this has a you know, pretty simple, just calls the start link on my two modules. Uh, they don't need any parameters. They're hard-coded to know what registered names to talk to. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to expand that uh, in a little bit here. I have a simple little test method I used so that I can actually go over here into IEX. And um, my window is too big now. You guys still seeing enough of, enough of that? Uh, so I created a... Uh, Sanity test, which is just uh, IEX mix. I can do a run dash E and just tell it to run that test function at my application at my application level. So that was my way of just kind of seeing uh, debugging things and kind of just getting them basically working. So real basic stuff, nothing too exciting. There's actually two different people on different floors calling, and the elevator kind of processes each of those. And I wrote a a test, which I'm going to start up now because it's really slow. Because this was, this was the very novice level test. Uh, I know better than to do this. This is a horrible code smell. Timer sleeps in your tests. Uh, don't do this. We're going to make it better here in just a minute. I don't want to offend anyone here. So my test has to wait for the elevator car to do all of its, all of its thing. Now, in order to uh, make the test more comfortable to run at a, a faster velocity, I needed to parameterize some of these things that were hard-coded in my callback module. So I'm going to jump ahead to my next prepared git commit here. Let's see if my, there we go. So now in the test, I was able to use a setup, um, setup block, or I guess it's basically a function call. Um, that will actually create separate hall signal and car because notice in the, the last parameter to the car, I'm passing in infinity. So this timeout that the car is going to give to its behavior is now infinite. So that's not going to be pinging it. So I can handle that here in my test and speed up time. Now to make this work, I also uh, and managing the hall signal's name actually comes in as, as another parameter. And of course, the hall signal itself had to be given that to know how to register itself. And with this, you can now see that my mixed test shoots up. It's done. And I, and I threw in even extra tests here. So what I was able to do with that is um, create my own helper function to assert arrival, which is what I cared about here. So that here looks something like this. Um, it just keeps calling this, this continue function, which is going to send that tick, just a raw send, to the, uh, to the process. And what happens for all these raw sends? They get converted to handle infos. 
So I'm going to receive that timeout, and my business logic is going to execute here. Uh, I found this handy way to find out the message queue length. So I just keep calling it until the test process has something in its message queue, because it actually registers itself as the writer. I found another little handy thing that's just kind of scaring up the state here. Don't do this in production either, but you can actually pull the state out of one of these uh, actors. Uh, I was digging into APIs. Uh, like I said, I don't do it in production. Uh, you're, everyone who maintains your, maintains your code will, will uh, curse you and question your ancestry and who knows what else. Uh, they say to write your code uh, assuming that the guy who, person who maintains it is a axe murderer who knows where you live. So to make this work, there was a, you know, a couple of extra parameters added to start links. And of course, at the application level, I use some attributes to kind of keep track of these things and pass them in when they start. Uh, I didn't mention earlier that I, in this test function I made, it's just spawning a raw process as the writer. And this guy just kind of makes sure that, that the car arrives at the floor he, 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 came, he started at and then tells the car to go, and then make sure he arrives where he wanted to go. So this is my simple way of just kind of testing this and doing some sanity testing. But the downside now is all these I.O. puts everywhere. Uh, I kind of like my test output to be nice and neat. So my sort of next thing to explore was GenEvent. And this ended up being really simple here. So jumping ahead to the next version of the code, up here, up here in the application start, I'm able to just start a gen event. Uh, I was maybe too cute calling the attribute a venue, but I thought of you know, who hosts events. And a venue, uh, again, naming is kind of hard sometimes. It was a, it was a, the two hardest problems in computer, in, in computer science. Uh, so I can, I'm cheating here. If mixed environment's not equal to test, I'll actually uh, stream the gen event and dump it out. And that means all the, all the I.O. puts that I had before, I've converted to things like gen event notify. And I changed them all to tuples because I'm going to do a little bit more with them later and it just seemed to be a little bit more consistent. So I can still execute that same sanity test thing I showed you. And it's still going to Show me all my output. I can kind of see what's happening. But on the flip side, my tests, nice and neat. Six tests, zero failures in 0, 0.00 seconds. So that's a pretty good uh, test suite there. And now I want to go back to some slides. Supervisors are one of, the, one of the big things you hear all about OTP, and that's what enables all of the robust behavior. Uh, the slogan, let it fail, I love it. It's, it's shocking the first time you hear it. Uh, it really got me to pay attention, but I realize it's only half the story. You let it fail, but you have to have response, ha have a response, and um, realizing it's not a matter of if it fails, it's a matter of when it fails, realizing what depends upon what, and how they have to be restarted. Um, ironically, I found myself thinking longer and harder about failure modes than I normally do because it separates those concerns. That's, that's some of the design patterns of OTP. You can think about everything I showed you before was business logic pretty much. I didn't really have to think about uh, all of the robust behavior yet. I can actually think about that separately. Uh, and that's really powerful and not something I've seen in other frameworks. Uh, and this is where I, I, I mentioned the quip at the, at the, uh, early on about microservices. I think where they're going to fall down is if you've got 2,000 operating system processes across you know, 200 physical machines, something is going to die. They're going to have a restart 
you know, there's, there's Monit and God and other sort of operation level, uh, operating system level tools that do that, but they won't understand all of the dependencies between the parts of the overall system. And that's where OTP gets it right. They've made that sort of knowledge in the same language, in the same domain, the responsibilities are the same team. Uh, there's no separation of ops and developer teams that don't always communicate well. I know there's a push for DevOps, and that's a great idea. Uh, and maybe some of you are on teams where that's not, not an issue at all. But this takes some of those operational concerns really into the application developer, the one who really understands those dependencies. And you have the fine-grained control. Um, you know, microservices people like to talk about, you know, 100-line services. Well, I just showed you, you know, three of them right there. Uh, each, each one of my business logic modules were no more than 100 lines of code. So let me, let me kind of build up a supervision tree here for this system. I'd like to start at the elevator car. Um, the sample so far I showed you just had a single car, uh, but you would expect, you know, there's buildings that have, you know, two, four, six, you know, elevator cars that all serve the same floor. So I want to have a car supervisor. Notice my, my clever name there. Uh, let's start up multiple, multiple copies of this callback module. These don't depend upon each other. A one-for-one -one restart strategy works great for these. But we can't forget the cars still depend on, the, on a hall signal. And they both, both types depend on that gen event now. So we can build up these supervision trees and you build them the way your problem dictates based upon dependencies. Uh, so I came up with another clever name. I called it an elevator bank that's going to uh, start the gen server, start the hall signal, and then start the car supervisor. And with this, because of that order of dependencies, I'm able to use a rest for one strategy, which uh, if you haven't encountered that, it means starting left to right, if any process fails, it will restart that one and all the ones to the right. Uh, so it's a way, you don't have to restart the world, it doesn't have to be a one for all, uh, but it's a nice thing if you can order your dependencies that way. These sorts of things are really cool. But that wasn't enough for me. I wanted to take this to the next level. Uh, you ever been in a you know, tall uh, office tower that has one bank of six elevators that serves floors 1 through 15 and another bank of six that serves 16 through 30? Well, one building's elevator system may have multiple banks. So I wanted to allow for that in my code. And it's, a, it's, it's a simply a matter of getting another supervisor in there. So now I have the, the top level elevator supervisor that can supervise multiple banks of elevators. These again are totally isolated from each other and a one for one restart strategy works great for these. Uh, I wanna highlight something else here, uh, playing with gen event. Right now I have each bank supervisor creating a gen event. But if I were the, you know, you know, the superintendent of some large uh, a hotel or something, I might want my different elevator banks to share some, some uh, status indicator. Uh, maybe something my security guards are kind of watching to see what the status of all the elevators in the building are. So again, without changing code, but by using config, I'm actually able to make that happen. And I'm getting short on time, I've got to move quickly here. Uh, this, I don't want to skip it, but um, if you haven't seen before, this here, the, the call to the worker function, uh, is a primary way you create a worker specification. And the supervisor is then told to supervise that based upon the specification. There's a little bit of a sort of um, impedance mismatch here that bit me and hopefully I can short circuit maybe for some of you who haven't, who haven't run across it yet. Right here, this, this call to the worker function takes a module name and a list of parameters. These are, these are going to be applied uh, and that means the list of parameters become multiple parameters in your callback start link. You decide how many parameters it has, you supply that list, things work great. But then look down here when you call gen server start link. That second one, you, you can pass in a list of parameters, 
but your init function has to pattern match on the list. That's because this is not really an apply situation. It's actually uh, using a single term. You're allowed to pass a single term into that init with an arity of one. So it's important to remember you need those square brackets in your init if you're gonna, if you're gonna pass things around in this fashion. Just as I was putting this together, I came up with a, I think I'm gonna play with it some more. I'll be happy to hear more feedback from you guys. Uh, a convention that I'm gonna try using is actually to have my callback start link function take just two parameters. One of them is going to be a tuple of the things init cares about, and the other can be the keyword list of options into gen server start link. I think it's a little bit more parallel, a little bit, uh, a little bit clearer what's going on. That you you have to write a tuple when you create your worker, and you're matching on a tuple in your init. So I'll be happy to talk to anyone more later in the conference. And now let me jump back to the code. And I have to punch a button on here that says stop. There we go. So back in the code. Uh, I want to jump ahead to my next commit here. Um, at my application level, I've actually started using the uh, configuration now. So I've pulled all those hard-coded references out of the attributes even, uh, and now they've gone into my config. So I actually allow for a config uh, in the application environment is how you get at those. I might want to connect in a distributed fashion to nodes. And I can take a variable list of banks defined in my config and loop over those and create some bank supervisors. And the bank supervisor pulls out of that bank definition all the various pieces it needs, uh, venue, display, number of cars, the tick amount, and creates, uh, I've wrappered the gen event in this elevator status, uh, because I actually allow different display types now. Uh, creates the hall signal, and creates this car supervisor. And these guys have a lot more parameters than they had before. You kind of have to pass these in, but since you're not hard coding them, it gives you the flexibility of things you can do in your config. And the car supervisor, uh, not particularly exciting, uh, it takes the number of cars it was, it was told to, to uh, supervise and creates a, creates a worker spec for each one of those. Uh, this, is, this is a case that uh, I didn't see in some of the early OTP tutorials. I can't name this car process because I have multiple copies of it running. So you can't register it under a name. So you use this, this ID is how the supervisor keeps track of its, of its various copies. Of that, of that process. And how am I doing on time? Okay, five minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna jump kind of to the grand finale here. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to anyone more uh, looking at more details of the code here. But I have created uh, one, another one of my cheater things here. Uh, shell script that sets a certain mix environment name. So this tells me which config is going to be executed. This is the config called visual node. And I can actually show this. Uh, this is pretty simple, but note here that since I've taken the names we register these processes out of hard-coded, now I can actually register it and get, uh, give it a tuple that's a, global a, a globally registered name. So I'm set for distribution by, by changing in my config how I want to register these things. And I'm going to go ahead and start that, start that node. Over here, I have another configuration. Uh, But this tries to register an event name under the same global. I was able to write the, write the code when I start up the gen event. Uh, if it's already registered, you can actually return an ignore atom back to the supervisor, which says, hey, it didn't start up, you don't, but you don't have to supervise it, but life goes on. And so what, the, what this lets me do 
is um, another one of my cheater shell scripts here. Uh, I'm able to kind of start a separate node that's actually going to execute. I've got, a, I've got a, a, a T method defined in my elevator that's just going to randomly start choosing floors and uh, trips for people to take on the elevator. So I can actually execute this on a separate node here. This is going to start up. It's going to find the gen event on the, on, the, on the first node that I started. And it's supposed to. There we go. Uh, I played with some, with some UTF-8 characters and just created a simple little visualization of what's happening to the cars on the elevator. Uh, sometimes they get, they get synchronized and then they'll kind of go out of order. So I've, I've had fun just kind of sitting here staring at it for like 10 minutes. Just to go, <laughs> Look what I built. And now back to uh, last wrap-up slide here. Some of the takeaways. I wanted to make a distinction between the behavior module that OTP gives you, the, the, the generalized decades of experience in building these. Uh, take a, take the, the generic behavior out, reuse that, versus your callback module, which is the specific behavior that your application needs. There's a couple of things that can trip you up how you do these start links and the initialization steps. Uh, I will tweet out a link to, the, to these slides later. Um, parameter and return value contracts. This is how you communicate between the behavior and the callback module. Uh, set up your supervisors in your tree according to your application. Restart strategies, there's, there's not very many to choose from, but that coupled with the tree structure and supervisors gives you a lot of flexibility in responding to failure and getting your system back into a known state. And with config, you can do a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, try, to, try not to hard code things. All that knowledge you've learned in, in, in past OO type of languages is still important here. Uh, move things out into configuration that makes sense. Your app becomes more flexible. And that's the end. Uh, I do have the exact code that I showed here uh, up on this link. And uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>